Trevor is the Savior. He's still alive. We're going to be in John chapter 20 this morning, if you will. Turn to John chapter 20. The story is told of an uncle who one day was driving, leisurely driving his convertible up in the mountains, perhaps around Sevier, Villa Pigeon Forge, or Gatlinburg. And he had the top down, the convertible top was down, he had the radio turned up loud, and he was enjoying to the fullest the beauties of the winding mountain road on which he was driving. You all know what we're talking about. We're, we're Tennesseans, aren't we? And so intent was he on the scenery, and so deafened was he by the blaring of the radio, he failed to notice the driver behind him who was becoming more and more impatient, frustrated, even angry. Finally, the road presented sufficient room for the furious driver to pass, and a blast of the horn and a shake of the fist and some not-so-well-chosen words were not sufficient to appease the anger of the hostile motorist. Forcing this uncle's car to the side of the road he proceeded to verbally vent his frustration. This uncle, who had been oblivious to the whole matter until now, proceeded to apologize profusely for the inconvenience that he had caused, saying, I'm sorry, I had no idea. Please forgive me, I apologize. But no apology was sufficient for this road rage driver. The man said, your apology is not enough. I'm going to pick you up out of that car and I'm going to beat you to a pulp, the man threatened. As the motorist began to close in on him, the uncle quickly removed a 45 caliber revolver from under the seat and aimed it point blank at, at his attacker. With only a moment's hesitation, the attacker blurted out, I accept your apology. <laughs> he returned to his car and went his way. The moral of the story is only one single unexpected element can completely change the perspective on a situation. And that's what we're going to find today in this account of the resurrection of <coughs> Jesus Christ. Nobody expected it except the enemies that feared it. But what's, what, what happened was shocking to all. Let's look at John chapter 20, verse 1. <laughs> Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. <clears throat> then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, <coughs> one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking it was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, 
Tell me where you have put him, and I will go get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hand, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. <clears throat> this is what it's all about, folks. The resurrection of Jesus Christ proving that he is who he said he was, and then the only thing left is for us to believe him and go tell others to believe in him. So Jesus Christ, the, all four Gospels record his resurrection story. Now, before his death, before this happened, you know his, his reputation among the Jews and the Sanhedrin, the popular opinion among them <coughs> was that Jesus was a menace. Jesus was a troublemaker. He must be removed. And so when He went to the cross, they were glad for His crucifixion. Maybe we can get on with things, they must have said. That troublemaker is out of the picture. We can finally move on to our religiosity and our political maneuvering and just get on with life. They had no idea what was about to happen. Jesus, though, predicted, did He not? Predicted that He would not only die, but He would rise from the dead. Listen to this out of Matthew chapter 12. This is just one prediction He made in verse 38, that some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to Him, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from You. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. One of many predictions that he would die. In fact, even the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and the enemies of the cross knew that Jesus said he would rise again. 
In fact, his whole ministry depended on him rising again. So what they tried to do was try to cover up what happened. They were going to do all they could to prevent him coming out of the grave or to prevent it looking like he came out of the grave. But that's what happened. Anyway, regardless of all of their, their precautions, Jesus did arise from the grave. The fact that Jesus arose from the grave is an essential, central part of the gospel message. Listen to this verse out of Romans 10. You know this. Romans 10, verse 9. It says, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So believing that Jesus rose from the dead <coughs> is essential to true saving faith. This is the gospel, that he died, that he was buried, and then he rose again. His death, first of all, he died a real death. This was not the swoon theory. He didn't just fall into a coma and then wake up and say, Hey guys, what's up? How have y'all been? It is not that. He actually died. He was truly, finally, hopelessly dead. Not asleep. Not in a coma. According to John 19, we see that his death was confirmed by even his enemies and the disciples and every witness, the Roman soldiers in John 19.33 were satisfied that he was dead. Romans, or John 19.33, when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Verse 34, instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water piercing the pericardium around the heart, going into the actual heart muscle, so it came out and blood and water flowed out. There is no way he could have survived something like that. This is medically proven. Blood and water came out of him. He was gone. Joseph came, Nicodemus came, <coughs> prepared his body for burial. Later on, the women who followed him would come and help with the burial arrangements. Since Jesus died around 3 p.m. on Friday afternoon, and the Sabbath was to begin three hours later at 6 p.m., they tried to do a rush job of getting him off the cross and into the tomb and start his wrapping and prepare preparation for his <laughs> what they thought his sleep in that tomb. So there's no time. They would have to come back after the Sabbath on Sunday morning to finish the job that they had started. And so he was buried. He was placed in a borrowed tomb. He, he didn't even own a tomb. He was placed in a borrowed tomb. And you know what's interesting? If you read the Gospels, none of the 11 disciples helped out with this at all. It was Joseph of Arimathea, who was kind of a Johnny-come-lately, and then Nicodemus, who we met in John chapter 3. <coughs> the only Pharisee that we know of to come to saving faith. The tomb was secured very, very well. Listen to Matthew 27. <coughs> like I said, all four Gospels record the resurrection account. Matthew 27, verse 62. <coughs> The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I'll rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. That this last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. 
Go, listen, go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. They did everything possible in the Roman military way of sealing that tomb that there would be no possibility of the disciples stealing the body and falsifying a resurrection. But did you know the disciples wouldn't have done that anyway? You know what the biggest reason is? They did not expect a resurrection. They thought that he was dead and that was it. It was not a good day. It was not a good day to be a disciple of Jesus Christ after his death. That was one of the last things you would ever want to be was a follower of Jesus after he died on the cross. And so for extra security, they made extra sure that the disciples would not take the body, being over-cautious. Yet you know what happened? All of those extra measures only served God's purpose, didn't it? It only did what God wanted to happen. It kind of reminds me of the showdown on Mount Carmel between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, as if to show that God truly is God. So Elijah didn't just set up the uh, altar and the offering. He poured water on it three times, soaked it. The ground was soaked, and it made a, mo a, a trench of water around it. And he did everything possible to make sure it would not be faked. And you know what happened. God showed up and burned up the entire offering and the stone and the water and the people attending it and everything. And so they secured the tomb to no avail because he rose from the dead. All four Gospels record this important event. <laughs> They're slightly different accounts, aren't they? You know that Matthew and Mark and Luke and John are all a little bit different. Luke gives a lot of details. Mark, as you would expect, just gives a little bit. Six verses. But they're due to different perspectives. They do not contradict each other. Don't let anyone tell you that the Bible contradicts itself. Because it simply does not. Imagine yourself as a disciple in those days, trying to piece together what happened when you were in absolute, utter shock, you would be grateful just to get a word in, wouldn't you? But yet, the four gospel accounts all harmonize and give us the picture of what actually happened that day. Jesus, unseen by human eyes, was literally and physically raised to new life from the dead. His heart was mended. His pericardium came back together. He arose from the dead. There's only one thing that the Gospels do not report. And that's the actual resurrection itself. And it's interesting that no person saw Jesus come to life inside the tomb. Yet what we talked about this morning in Sunday school, there's no event in world history more proven and more attested to than the resurrection of Christ. You simply cannot disprove it. There is too much evidence showing that he really did rise from the dead. In fact, I don't have enough blind faith to believe that he didn't rise from the dead. I don't have enough blind faith to accept that. I'm sorry, I don't. Mary was lingering at the tomb, figuring out what was happening, assuming that they took the body. And then as we read earlier, Jesus came to her in a beautiful story and spoke her name, said, Mary. And she turned and said, Rabboni. And she clung to him. She loved him so much. Held on to him in his new, perfect resurrection body. He is called the firstborn of the dead in Revelation chapter 1. And this resurrection body, as, as Bob Deffenbaugh says, quote, his body was a transformation and in this transformation, Jesus was both similar to his old self, yet strangely different as well. You know, he was the same, but he was very different. He, his body bore the marks of crucifixion. Mary recognized his voice, right? She recognized his speaking voice. But he was not limited by objects, such as the locked doors or the grave clothes, or the tombstone. But he could pass through solid objects. According to John, this is exactly, exactly what we find happening in John 20. <laughs> he did literally 
rise from the grave. And he showed us what kind of a resurrection body we are going to have. You will be recognizable, believer in Christ. You will be recognized by your loved ones. Yet you will have a physical body that will not anymore be subject to disease or pain or decay, but you will live forever in a physical flesh body. That is what we have to look forward to. So like I told Brother James this morning, he is going to hold his wife's hand physically. Literally, because we will rise physically. That's the hope of Jesus Christ. How would anyone not want to follow this Savior? The resurrection is the cornerstone of all of our faith, all of our hope, and all of our assurance. You see, as I've said, since Christ is the most important figure to have ever lived on earth, and we see from the Gospels that the resurrection is the most important event in his life. We must therefore conclude that the greatest event in all of history is exactly what we're celebrating this morning. And that is the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And here's the significance of, of his rising from the dead. Here's where the rubber meets the road. Here's why it really does matter forever. The first thing. Most importantly, since the resurrection is crucial and central to the gospel message, according to 1 Corinthians 15, first of all, the empty tomb validated Jesus' words, Jesus' life, and Jesus' ministry. So it once for all establishes credibility. People still scoff and say Jesus was merely a good teacher. Or he was merely a political revolutionary. Nonsense. Jesus didn't say those things. He said he was God. He said that the only way to heaven is through him. And other, many other things like that. So did he just die as a martyr? Did he just die as a philosopher? No. Because he's alive. What he said really counts. <laughs> It's been said, if the resurrection of Jesus is false, then nothing else matters. But if the resurrection of Jesus is true, then nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. He did many signs and wonders, didn't he? He healed the sick, he raised the dead, he calmed the storm. Many, many signs and many wonders throughout his life. And this was, this rising from the dead was his very last sign to Israel, wasn't it? He said, no sign will be given to this generation but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he mentioned Jonah being down, down, down in the depths for three days, and Jonah came back from the depths after three days. So rising from the dead was the last and final sign to Israel. It also then began the ministry to the Gentiles. No longer did Jesus say, keep it quiet, keep it hush-hush. But after the resurrection, He said, now you have the story. Now go and tell. Go to the Gentiles. Jesus, the Jewish Nazarene, is the Savior of the whole world. He is Messiah, but also, more than that, He is the Son of God. Romans 1.4, it says, Through the Spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Rising from the dead was His proof that He is the Son of God. So this claim of being God's Son, which got Him in so much trouble with the Sanhedrin, now with the resurrection, that's settled. He is the Son of God, period. It proved it. The resurrection also proved that Jesus is able to save sinners. We have a real Savior. Not just a pretend one, but a real Savior. He came and claimed to be the Savior of the world. And so what? Well, He rose from the dead. That's what? And prove that he's the Savior. 
Romans 4, 25. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So that raising from the dead was proof that he can save sinners. He, he, he talked all the time why he came to earth. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. And we know that his cross demonstrated his great love, demonstrated his intention to die for sinners. But the empty tomb proved that he accomplished salvation, that he actually did it. Not just that he intended to do it, but that he did it. He really did forgive sin. He said he would, and his resurrection proved it for us. No, number three, out of Romans 6 and Romans 8, the resurrection, now here we go, you ready? Boldly confronts us. It boldly confronts us, all of us, with the demand to live godly and holy and righteous lives. Okay? And I'll show you why. Yes, we are called to live holy, righteous lives. You might say, really? Well, no one's perfect. Well, that's true. But the very power of the resurrection is our source for godly living. Okay? The resurrection power that brought Jesus from the dead is our power to live godly in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there's no excuse. <laughs> there's no reason not to live holy because we have the Spirit's power. Romans 6, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We die to sin. How can we live in it any longer? He says, verse 5, if we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with. In verse 8, now if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over Him. And he says finally in verse 12, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. His point is this. It's a little complicated, but it's this. We have died with Christ as Christ died on the cross we die, but as He rose, we also live. And that new life is to put to death the deeds of the old body. So therefore, to say I will not live a holy life is really punching God in the face and saying, God, you have no power. It's really not valid. To say that we cannot be holy, we cannot be godly, we can't stop sinning, says to God, you are not powerful. And that power that raised Jesus from the dead is not sufficient for me. But that's not the truth. Whatever God commands, God empowers, and the resurrection proves it. Whatever God commands, God empowers. Number four, it roots all of God's promises and it roots our salvation in a historical fact. You can breathe on this one. You can relax on this one. Because the basis of our salvation is not what we do. It is by what He has done. In fact, in space, in time. It's not just about our religion. It's not about our faith. It, lots of people have a religion and a faith. It is about truth, reality, and fact. The New Testament writers do not know anything about a, quote, faith without historical events. It had to have happened. So when Paul says in Romans 15, for example, that, uh, or 1 Corinthians 15, that it is based on what he actually did, he says things like this. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. If it didn't really happen, let's pack it all up and go home. 
Because it's, it's futile, it's pointless, it's worthless. He says it's the gospel that saves. Not just any gospel, but the one true gospel that points to Jesus Christ. The only gospel that actually saves. And his language here is of language of first importance, of priority. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance importance. That is priority. First importance. It's the center of it all. So if the gospel is the center of the Christian life and the resurrection is the center of the gospel, we cannot talk too much about how important it is. Yeah. It's about His rising. All truth is important. Don't get me wrong. It's important to know what we believe about baptism and the end times and the doctrine of the church and the doctrine of salvation. All of that's important. But certain truths are essential and non-optional because they are life and death. The cross and the empty tomb is the center of Christianity. If there was no cross, if there was no empty tomb, we have no reason to be Christians. Well, you say, what well, makes me feel good? It doesn't matter. Buddhism can make you feel good. Hinduism can make you feel good. But if he didn't really die and he didn't really rise, we have nothing. We're left with nothing. And that is why the enemies of Christ go after these two. The cross and the tomb. They'll always go after those two things. Any claim of truth is subject to historical verification. We have to be able to say, prove it. And if Christ, if God can't prove it, then it is not worth pursuing. But God did prove it. He proved it in many, many, many ways. Christianity is subject to verification, and it's the only worldview that actually accounts for all the facts. No religion, no worldview actually accounts for the facts of God's creation, the revelation of God, the coming of Christ, what He said and taught, and especially the empty tomb. Nothing. No other worldview explains it. Every other worldview has to turn a blind eye to something or deny something that's obvious. Only Christianity explains it all. Jesus made many statements, didn't He? Many claims, many demands. He said many bold things and many disturbing things. He, he, he said that Absolute allegiance must be given to Him. He, he even said that even if you're helpless in sin, even if you can't help but sin, you must give absolute allegiance to Jesus Christ. He also said that an eternity apart from Jesus Christ would lead to the judgment of Almighty God. As if God is saying, why didn't you believe me? Why didn't you listen to my son? I even brought him back from the dead. What else do you need? What else do we need? Indeed, what else do we need? God has said everything God needs to say. What we must do is follow him with all our might. <laughs> Colossians 3.1 Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you die. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. That is, our real life is with Him. If you don't know Him today, the Bible says that you are dead. That there is no life in you. But He died. This resurrection was the one thing that changed everything. This changed everything. No longer is there a myriad of religions to choose from. Now all we're left with is receive Christ in the resurrection or deny Christ and somehow deny the resurrection. Good luck with that. See, if Christ never rose from the dead, it's all a hoax, and it's all a sham, and nothing else matters. But if Christ has been raised, 
And indeed He has. If Jesus has been raised, then nothing else matters. What we're left with is go and tell. Go and tell. This is exactly what the Bible tells us, isn't it? After the resurrection, all the disciples could do was run around and go tell everybody that we have a risen Master. He is alive. We saw Him. Like the song goes, I know my Redeemer lives. In fact, I talked with Him just this morning. I talked with Him just this morning. Amen. And I close with Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. And may God bless this congregation and God's Word as it's being read today. It says, May the God of peace May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing His will. And may He work in us what is pleasing to Him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray.